If you are uh, someone who brought your own Bible, this morning I'm going to be going through a lot of different scripture passages fairly quickly. How many of you remember sword drills from when you were younger? Yeah, so if you remember sword drills, you might be able to keep up with me. If not, that's okay. You can follow along with a few of the passages, and then again, all of them will be on the screen as I'm reading them. Uh, we've been in this series for a couple of months now where we've been looking at what's going on in our world, the crises that surround us. There are lots of different layers and lots of different impacts of the crises that are unfolding, and how we as the church, how we as individual followers of Jesus Christ should respond. What does God want to do in us and through us? What does he want to teach us? How does he want to draw us closer unto himself? How does he want to use us in this world that is facing these crises? Last week, we hit on the first Sunday where, you know, many of us were gathered together. We hit on one of the most important ideas that we need to be the church that is united, united as one in Jesus Christ, united as one by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this morning, we're going to look at what does it mean for us to be individually and corporately the church on mission for Jesus Christ. So I invite you to join me in prayer, and then we'll dive into the word together. Lord God, we thank you that you are in this place, and we thank you that you are gathered with every single person who is watching online or streaming this in their car or gathered in another room in this building. We thank you, Lord, that you are with your gathered people, and we pray that you'd be glorified now. Teach us, Lord God, by your word and by your spirit, transform our hearts and our minds. May we individually and collectively look more and more and more like you, Jesus. This world desperately needs more Jesus, and you love to inhabit your people and work in and through your people to bring your love, your peace, your presence, your good news, your salvation to all who need those messages and those touches from you. So be glorified in us now. We pray this in your name. Amen. Uh, for those who are young or young at heart, we do provide some words of the day that you can keep track of these words to help uh, those young minds stay engaged. So we always invite you to mark down anytime I say one of the names of God, Heavenly Father, Father, Son, Jesus, Holy Spirit. And today you can add to that the word mission and see how many times I say those words this morning. I want to begin this morning by giving you a warning. I'm about to make a controversial statement. And, and, you know, you, you got to be on the edge of your seat when your pastor is about to make a controversial statement, right? Here's the controversial statement. I believe that God's number one priority in this world with people over the last four months has not been trying to figure out how to help us to gather together in person once again to worship him. Was that controversial? Okay, some, some smattering. Not, not quite sure, but, you know, most of you are kind of on. I, I don't think that's a very controversial statement, and there's reasons we'll get into that, very good biblical reasons that I'll explain a little bit more later. Uh, and yet sometimes what I have felt over the last four months, and probably what many of you have felt, is I can't wait till we can get back together in person and worship Jesus. And that is a good thing. It is a good thing to think those things to feel those ways, it is a good thing that the board and staff and other leadership teams in the church have poured a great deal of time and energy into figuring out how we can come back together to worship Jesus. You know, the scriptures teach us to not give up the gathering to worship our Lord, and sadly in our day, at least in our country, so many believers treat gathering on a weekly basis as kind of an optional thing if you have time, and that's not right. And that's not good. And in the time being, we're going to continue to have brothers and sisters who are gathering us virtually, who are gathering us online for months on end, and that is okay. You're still gathering with your brothers and sisters to worship Jesus Christ, and yet it can seem like, at least I have felt like, the number one priority of the church in the United States has been trying to figure out how do we get back together, how do we gather together. So if, if that's not God's number one priority, most of you didn't think that was a very controversial statement. I was trying to really shock you this morning, but I failed in that. What do you think? I want to give you a minute to think about or speak with a neighbor or pray about. What do you think God's number one priority has been over these last four months? You've got a minute to think about that to briefly talk about it, to brainstorm, what do you think that is?
Sounds like there's a, you know, a smattering of some good conversation that is happening. And, you know, hopefully this is something that what we're mindful of is God does have desires. God does have work that he wants to see accomplished. God does have priorities. And how do we as God's children, how do we as the body of Jesus Christ align with those priorities and values? So here's the most important thing. If you're ever wondering what is on the heart and mind of God, one of the primary places that we should always go is to the scriptures, right? This is where we learn what is important to our God, what, is he, what he is trying to accomplish in our world. And so this is where, if you're good at sword drills, you might be able to keep up with me. But turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. I'll give you time to find that passage first. I'm going to read a variety of passages. And as I'm reading these, I would invite you to hear them and to read them on the screen or in your Bible with that thought in mind of what is God's number one priority? What has he been do trying to do over these last four months? Because I believe scripture gives us the answer. So Mark chapter 1, the second half of verse 14 through 18, I believe the pronouncement, the proclamation that Jesus makes here was the greatest news and the most important declaration that the world had heard since God spoke into existence all that surrounds us. So we read in Mark 1.14, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. So again, reading that passage, hearing that passage with the thought of what has God's greatest priority been over these last four months. Let's go on to Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Jesus said this about himself, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. John chapter 4, verses 34 through 36. My food, Jesus, this is right after Jesus has done something amazing with a Samaritan woman and so many in the community hear her word of testimony about who Jesus is and ultimately they place their faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus in this interaction when the disciples find him after this visit with the Samaritan woman, uh, they, he, Jesus says that my food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest. I tell you, Open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, again, Jesus speaking to his disciples, but here, right before he's about to ascend into heaven, some of his last words to his disciples, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Again, listen to these passages. Think through them with that idea of what is God trying to do amongst us, not only over these last four months, but over all time. Acts 1 Chapter 4 through 9, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, again, Jesus, these last moments with his disciples before he ascends to the Father, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Meaning, are you finally, Lord? going to overthrow these r wicked oppressors, these Romans, and allow the nation of Israel to once again rise up as a local, regional, national, prominent state that has power and dominion and authority over its enemies. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, his promise to return. Jesus promised to return and take his children, his followers, his disciples, to be with him for all of eternity. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 
And finally, from Revelation chapter 21 and then one verse from chapter 22. And as you turn there, I'm going to invite you to stand as I read this text. So the Apostle John, very near the end of his life, is getting this amazing revelation by the Spirit of God. Jesus is speaking to him, revealing to him, to him what the last days would look like, what would happen, what is to come. And at the end of chapter 21, he's been giving this, uh, John, this revelation of what the new Jerusalem, what heaven, what the heavenly city would look like. And we, we read in verse 22, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb it's, is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And finishing out with chapter 2, verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. You may be seated. Powerful, powerful text. And hopefully, as you read, as we read through those texts, some themes began to leap off the surface of the pages to you. Uh, it became very obvious, obvious what God's number one priority amongst people is in these days of challenge and trial and crisis. And ever since Jesus was sent to earth, God's number one priority has not been figuring out a way that we could meet in person again. Rather, God's number one priority back when Jesus came and now in these days is the salvation of the world. God's number one priority, his number one desire is to save men and women and children, to bring them into a life-giving, life relationship with himself. And he desires to accomplish that mission through his Holy Spirit and through his Holy Word and through his holy people. You are an integral part of that mission going forward. And if each of us accepts our joyous opportunity to walk along Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, bringing his love, his good news, that message of forgiveness and salvation, God will save many. God will save many. And as we looked at a few weeks ago, Jesus is coming soon. I believe that we're living in the last days. I don't know how long the last days will last, and yet Jesus is coming soon. The time is running short to bring this message of good news and salvation to all who need it. Let me ask you to just do a little thought, and these are rhetorical questions, but when you think of the state of the world around us, when you think of the state of people that you know as we've gone through these last four months of pandemic and trial and crisis in so many different levels, are there more needs in the lives of people around us or fewer needs? Are people more hopeful in general or less hopeful? Is there more suffering in the world around us and in people's lives or less suffering than six months ago? Are people more secure in their understanding of what life is about and how to meet their needs and take care of the people around them or less secure in those things? Is there more fear in the world, in the hearts, in the minds of people all around us or less fear than six months ago? Is there more spiritual need in this world? Are there more questions that are being asked? Or are there fewer questions? Is there less spiritual need? The time is now and the need is greater than it has been in a really, really long time. In fact, if you were to do a, a search, and I don't know how to do these things, I, I got this clip art from another church, but uh, this is a Google search for the question, this is a popular the Google search for the question, is God real? And you can't really make out the timeline very well, uh, but the second to last date is February 16th. And guess what? As soon as the pandemic hit the shores of the United States and people began to realize that this was gonna be a major, traumatic, difficult thing, the interest of that question, is God real, according to Google, was at 100%, meaning it doesn't get any higher than that. 
it's at its all-time peak. And then in these subsequent waves where, you know, more illnesses was, was accumulating and whatnot, and you see that we're on the way up again. I don't know what it is today. That ends kind of middle of June. But there are significant questions that are being asked by people all around us, desperate for the truth, desperate to have their spiritual answers, their needs met, their suffering to be over, and we have the answer. The reality is that Jesus, the, the, the world needs more Jesus. The world needs more Jesus. And the way that the world receives more Jesus is as we, as the followers of Jesus, who are indwelt by the Spirit of God and have Jesus living in our hearts, bring him into the world around us. That's how the world receives and experiences more Jesus in light of all of these other realities. The mission of First Baptist Church is You didn't say it in unison, but you did well. The, the mission of First Baptist Church is helping people know love and become like Jesus. That is what we are all about as a church. And I'm so thankful that so many of you personally are all about that as well. You're open to the ways that the Spirit wants to work in and through you to bring Jesus into the lives of people around you. And this mission cannot be accomplished in the ways that God desires to us to accomplish this mission apart from every one of us saying, yes, Lord, I want to be part of that. I, I, I'm thankful and I'm blessed that we as a church do that corporately in a lot of wonderful, meaningful, impactful ways. And I personally want to be part of fulfilling this mission of helping people know love and become like Jesus. Reality is that we have an enemy. That is our mission, and God wants to do great things in us and through us as we walk in that mission by the power and leading of the Holy Spirit. But here's another controversial statement. Again, maybe it's not too controversial. But Satan would love to prevent or thwart or counteract what God wants us to do in us and through us through that God-given mission. And three of his primary weapons are, number one, and this is really looking more corporately, although certainly these things can be personal as well, but number one, Jesus or Satan wants to divide the church of Jesus Christ. Satan wants to divide the church of Jesus Christ. And we looked at that last week. And this morning when I was talking about Bibles, and again, I wasn't part of this conversation, but you know, the other staff member who was engaging with these church family members uh, seemed to indicate that, well, if the Bibles aren't in the pews, then, then we're gonna go to another church. And, and again, if God calls you to worship and become part of another church family, blessings on you. If that's what God desires you to do, be obedient and follow him in that. And yet, I believe that God wants to draw us together in this time where Satan is working overtime trying to divide us around so many different issues, around so many different things. And God wants us to be one as the Father and the Son are one, he desires us to be one. And again, that's a supernatural gift from the Spirit of God, and yet we have to participate in that. We all have to be willing to lay aside some of our personal preferences, myself included, in order to embrace what God has for us as a community of believers. And that's been difficult for churches since the very beginning. You don't have to read too far, far into some of Paul's epistles, some of the letters to those early churches to recognize that they had a whole lot of division around a whole lot of things. And so Satan has been working from the day when Jesus launched the church to help divide the church. And yet we have to be one to submit to the Spirit and be one to love one another as Jesus has loved us. Another primary weapon of Satan in this season and all seasons is distraction. So it is really easy right now for us to have our hearts and minds consumed by and our thoughts consumed by a thousand things that in the moment seem to be just as important or perhaps we give it greater importance than the mission of God for us to bring Jesus, to help people know, love, and become like Jesus. That needs to be primary and yet I am so distracted and we are so distracted by so many things on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. Again, I, I can't remember who the first one to say it was, but uh, Daniel Henderson is the one I, that I think I heard say it first, that one of Satan's primary weapons against us are weapons of mass distraction. 
And in this world, we just keep inventing new and better ways to be distracted from everything that is going on around us. And so we have to fight really hard against all those distractions, keep our eyes, our hearts, our minds fixed on Jesus Christ, and ask him to lead us and guide us so that we can be effective in the mission that God has given us. And the last D is derivative. Here are some synonyms for derivative, copied, unoriginal, Imitative. And really, I use derivative because I had to have another D word, right? And you're like, what is, what is, where is he going with this? Okay, well, this is my stretch. This is my stretch for the other weapon that Satan wants to use against us is that I believe Satan wants us to focus our time and energy primarily on or exclusively on how do we get things back the way they were? I mean, doesn't, doesn't that feel good and right? Like if things could just go back to the way they were. And the reality is, so much of the way things were was really good. And so many of the things that the way they were, they were, were going to work back in those directions. And yet, if we come through this season and all that happens in our midst is we go back to the way things were, we will have missed so much of what God wants to teach us. We will have missed as a congregation so much of what God wants to do in us and through us in this season and on into the future. We can't focus all our time, energy, and attention on simply trying to get things back the way they were. We instead need to say, God, in this new normal, and that's probably a phrase or a word that we're getting sick of hearing, but in this future that you are creating and designing and folding in our midst, how can we better honor and glorify, love and serve you, and bring your love and good news to people who are dying without it. Listen to this from Acts chapter 1. Again, a reminder of a text that we read just a few moments ago. He said to them, Jesus says to his disciples, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then from Acts chapter 8, we looked at this passage a few weeks ago, but there's a persecution that breaks out amongst the believers in Jerusalem, and listen to what happens. Jesus has said to his disciples, you'll be my witnesses here and throughout the world, and listen to what happens. Acts chapter 8. Verse 1, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. How did the Great Commission to bring the gospel to people outside of Jerusalem spread. How did that become a reality? How did that happen? It was because of persecution and it was because ordinary men and women brought the gospel to the communities that God planted them in. The apostles did not go. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And it was not the apostles that he used to carry the good news of Jesus Christ and plant churches in Judea and Samaria. It was you. It was you. It was people just like you who did not have a seminary degree, who did not have any church planting training, who did not have a clue in so many of the things that we think you need to know and need to have in order to be part of something like sharing the gospel or planting a church. They were people who were filled with the Spirit of God and inspired by the love of Jesus Christ to bring his good news wherever God led them in the midst of this persecution. And I believe today God wants to do this exact same kind of work through men and women, students and children, just like you. God wants to do this mission through you and through me. I get to be part of it too. I don't think God is excluding leaders, pastors, missionaries, those kinds of things, but I believe that God desires to accomplish his mission through every single person, every couple, every family who calls First Baptist Church, their church home, not just through the pastors, the missionaries, the other professionals who do this in ways that you think, well, I couldn't do that. You can. You can. God can use you to lead someone 
It's that decision where they place their faith in Jesus Christ, and he wants to do that through you and through me. Through these crises that are unfolding around us, God has multiplied the number of locations where people can hear the gospel and the number of ways and opportunities for people to hear and respond to the good news of Jesus Christ millions of times over. I, I believe that we are living right now, today, in the greatest expansion and really explosion of the gospel of Jesus Christ being shared that there's nothing in history that compares to what's going on today. Praise God for that. That's one of the great blessings, one of the great gifts. That, I mean, little churches in tiny communities have online presences now where the gospel is being declared and proclaimed. And churches that used to reach hundreds of people are now able to reach people around the globe with the good news of Jesus Christ. And every single one of your homes or apartments, one of your living areas has become a church in these last months. And I, got, I believe that God wants to use that for great purposes. God wants to use your home. He wants to use all of these resources. One of the phrases that came out early on, I, again, don't know who the first one to say it was, but the church was not closed. The church is not closed. It's been deployed. We continued to meet. There wasn't a Sunday that we didn't in some way worship God together, even though many of those Sundays we were scattered in our homes or other places where we were reading the sermon or listening to the sermon or watching the sermon and being part of the worship. We did never stop meeting. We were deployed, however. God sent us out to our homes, to our communities, to our workplaces to be the church there, and we need to continue to live in that way. We as the church embrace, we as followers of Jesus embrace all that God wants to teach us and do in and through us during these trials by continuing to become a church without walls. You know, again, I, it, it, it does sadden me that we've gone through a season where the church facility has not been as accessible and we haven't had gatherings here. Now, fortunately, we have moved back into a season where Groups have been meeting here for a month or so, and we're now having our second Sunday of worship services back in the building, and we're working towards a day where we can increase the number of gatherings and all of those kinds of things, and yet, and yet, again, if all we're aiming for, if all we're working towards is to try and get back to the day where we can just continue to gather here and not be living for Jesus out there, not be carrying the mission of Jesus Christ everywhere and into every relationship that he leads us, we will have missed the point. We will have missed the point. God wants us to be a church without walls where every person says yes to their role, their assignment in living out this mission in ways that bring God honor and glory. So how can you personally... Uh, my friend Weldon Hend Hendrickson likes to say, uh, Jared, it's great to study the Bible. It's great to understand what God's word said. But so what? Like if all we have is a greater understanding of what God has said to his people in his word, what God has done in his people thousands of years ago, but we don't connect that with what is going on in our lives today personally, our study has maybe been of some intellectual value, but it's, it's not of a heart and life, life transformation value. And so let's get down to brass tacks. What does this look like for you and for me personally to live out this mission of helping people know love and become like Jesus? Well, number one, we have to be a people of prayer. We have to be a people of prayer. That's a non-negotiable in your life personally, and hopefully there are times where you're gathering with other believers, at the very least, you know, your spouse or a close friend or your family, maybe a larger group than that, but we have to be a people of prayer. Here's one of the blessings of this season of pandemic. Our Wednesday night Bible study has grown in size. Even though there are more difficulties and challenges to us meeting, we have to, uh, you know, we're meeting outside right now. We have to deal with trains and heat and humidity, and yet God is drawing a larger group of people together at 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights to seek him in prayer, and those times of prayer are so meaningful, and God works through those. 
we had a whole year, actually a little over a year, 16 months of focusing on praying for three people. And just a couple Wednesday nights ago, a few of us shared about the ways that God has worked through those prayers to reach deep into the hearts and lives of people that we've been praying for and draw them unto himself and bring salvation into their lives. And that is an amazing thing. And may we all be a people of prayer. That is one of the primary ways that we are all called to engage on this mission. Number two, be yourself. So I think at times when it comes to sharing the love of Jesus in word and in action, we, we feel handicapped because we don't know what to say or we feel like we have in our mind this picture of a certain person that we know who's really good at evangelism or, or the picture of a pastor, a communicator, a preacher who is so effectively opens and dissects the word of God and we think, I could never be that. You don't have to be that. And if you try to be that, we'll all be hindered in our witness because your unique mix of gifts and personality and passion and relationships will be the secret ingredients to reach some people that no one else could reach with the love and good news of Jesus Christ. There are people in your life right now that God desires and may only be able to reach through you. And so embrace how God has wired you. Embrace the talents. Embrace the passions. Embrace the quirks. Embrace all that you are, knowing that God wants to use you and the unique relationships that you have to reach people with the good news and love of Jesus Christ. God wants to work through you, just like he did through those early church believers who were not apostles, who did not have specialized training, and yet brought the gospel into Judea and Samaria, and God multiplied the church many times over through them. Number three, be open to the Holy Spirit and be open to new relationships. I believe the Spirit of God will lead and guide you. You know, if you begin each day by saying, Lord Jesus, I'm yours. This day, I, I want to live completely for you. Holy Spirit, have your way in me. As I go through my day, reveal to me any person or any circumstance that you want to use me in to bring your love, your joy, your peace, your encouragement, your good news into. I believe that the Spirit will do that. He will answer that prayer. One of the sisters who shared at that prayer meeting a couple nights ago mentioned that when she was stepping into this new job, this was several years ago, but stepping into this new jo job, she just had this, this nudge from the Holy Spirit as she looked at one of her new co-workers, and the Spirit was saying to her, you're here for this woman. Meaning, you're not actually here to earn a living, although that will be a good thing. You're not here just to care for the clients who will come into your business. You're not here just to network and support and encourage your coworkers. I have you here for this particular woman. And it was just a few months ago that that woman placed her faith in Jesus Christ because of the ways that God was able to work through this sister of ours who was open to the Holy Spirit and began praying for that woman. And God might lead you into new relationships. He might not, but be open to that. Be open to that. Be open to old relationships that God wants to do a new thing in and through you in. Sometimes it's most difficult to share about the love and good news of Jesus with people that we've been in relationship with for 10, 20, 30, 50 years. Those can be some of the most difficult places to share about because we think, well, I should have probably done that 30 years ago. And I didn't, and they know I go to church, they know that I love Jesus, and yet I've never talked to them about this again, so I'm uncomfortable, and it seems awkward to open up that conversation. But in this season, as we saw from that Google search, so many people are searching for answers. They're open to spiritual conversation. They're desperate for some good news, some hope, some love. So be the source of that as the Holy Spirit leads you. Number four, really listen to people. You know, the reality is we, we don't really have to worry about a whole lot about knowing what to say if we are able to sit and listen, to be genuinely engaged, to love someone well just by being present with them and listening to them. God will work through us. This world is desperate for someone to sit down across a table from them and listen to them really listen to them. In this digital age that we live in where so many of our relationships and so many of our conversations 
happen through a screen. People are desperate for someone to look them in the eyes and to say, I care about you enough to sit here and listen to you, to learn more about you, about your life, to invite you to open up to me, and I want to share my life with you. And that provides a beautiful opportunity for the Holy Spirit to work and show you where he wants you to encourage and bless and love and speak into the life of that person with his truth. And finally, share the mercy, hope, love, and good news of Jesus with them in word and in action. And I have a little, you know, note there underneath that. Tap into the resources of God's kingdom. You're not alone in this. In fact, now, more than ever before in our history, there are gazillions of great gospel messages out there. There are so many resources that churches like ours have been putting online for you that you could download and print or share with someone, email someone. There are so many more ways for you to share the love, of good Je- the love and good news of Jesus in word and in action. So if, if you seek every day to be a loving person, to allow the love of Jesus to flow through you into the lives of others, you don't have to worry a whole lot about having the right words because there's a lot of great right words out there already and you can simply say, would you be open to listening to this message? Would you be open to reading this, you know, this, this book or this you know, blog or this document or whatever? You, know, would, would I, I, you can say, you can be very open and honest with a person that God is using you to love and you sense that you're supposed to share the gospel with them in some way. You can be very open and honest and say, you know what, I, I struggle to put things like this into words, but I know how much Jesus has changed my heart and life. I know the love of Jesus and the peace of Jesus, the forgiveness and salvation of Jesus, and I want that for you. And, and, and so I can't put these into words, but here's a resource for you. Here's a sermon you could listen to. Here's a book you could read that will help you understand in a new way what I know, what I believe, what I have felt and understand in a very deep way. Tap into the resources of God's kingdom as you and I live on mission for Jesus Christ. If we do these things, I believe God will bring salvation to many who are desperate. They might not even realize it, that the one that they are desperate for is Jesus Christ. But as we introduce them to Jesus and share about the amazing things that Jesus has done in our heart and mind and soul and life, they will desire to receive and experience that which can only come through a life-giving relationship, a life-saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. God, do this work in us. Do this work through us. Help us to understand that, yes, it is a joy and a privilege and a responsibility for us corporately to live on mission for you. And may you be glorified in us as we seek to do that in new ways, in stronger ways going forward. We desire to glorify you and lift your name on high. We thank you that as we're able to resume so much of what we've loved and appreciated in the past, that we are also open to new ways that you want to work in us and through us in this community and to the ends of the earth, God. And I thank you for ways that I've heard testimonies from brothers and sisters who are in this room or listening online right now, the ways that they have responded to your Holy Spirit and been about new works, loving and serving and caring for people that you've led them into over these last several months. And God, may we be committed not only corporately to living out that mission of helping people know love and become like Jesus, but may we personally be engaged every day. Time is running short. Jesus, you are coming soon. And you desire that everyone would come to repentance, that everyone would receive salvation. And so may we be ready at a moment's notice to respond to the nudges, the promptings of your Holy Spirit and share your love and share your good news in word and action with whomever you lead us to. We pray this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Will you stand? I can't wait to see and to hear what God is going to do through each and every one of you and through us corporately 
as we live as a church that is united and on mission for Jesus Christ. I believe God is going to do great things as we seek, love, and serve him in these ways and bring his good news far and wide. Lord, bless my brothers and sisters. Help us, Lord. Help us. We thank you that you are the one who does the heavy lifting. You are the one and the only one who can change, transform the heart and life of someone who needs to hear your gospel message. Help us to be courageous and bold and full of love as we do that by the power and leading of your Holy Spirit. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. As you make your way out today, again, do your best to do any visiting that you'd like to do uh, outside versus in our lobby or in here just so that we can keep that social distancing. We love you and we can't wait to see you again real soon.